Oh, everyone wants the, their camera off. Hi, Stephanie. That's not Stephanie. That's Sarah. Oh, yeah. Sarah I see you. I see you. Hi, guys. Come on in. Have a seat. Hi, everyone. Hi, everyone. Hello, hello. Oh, yeah. We have a lot of... Well, at least Charles and Shara are brave enough to show their faces. <laughs> and we've got Shara like in the pool. Nice, nice girl. Gotta love it. Hi, Sarab. Good to see you. Oh my gosh, so many great faces. Thanks for showing your faces, guys. Yeah, we have so many people with their video. Why are their videos off, Steph Stephanie? Shara, uh, Joel. Oh, well, well, I'm sure there's a ton more people coming in and joining. So I'll just keep admitting people as they come in. But um, welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Hope you're all staying safe and happy and healthy at home. On behalf of the entire uh, team at Script to Screens, Welcome and thanks for coming. We have an amazing event today for you. It's called Executing the Director's Vision with two master craftsmen that I'm so excited to introduce you guys to. One is the Academy Award winning key grip, Richard Mall. Say hi, Richard. Hello, everybody. Thanks for coming. <laughs> and the insanely talented master craftsman, Walter Bithel. So welcome, hey, guys. Um, their, their resumes are sick and off the charts, and it would take me about three hours to go through um, all of their resumes. So I'm just gonna touch on a couple of key points for their bio. So we're gonna start with Walter. Walter Bithel has been in the in film industry for 32 years. He started in 1988 as a production assistant on The Hunt for Red October. He was Sean Connery's assistant, then a production assistant. He worked as a stage manager, grip, key grip, electrician, assistant chief, lighting technician, best boy, and finally a gaffer, or what's called a CLT, chief lighting technician. He's worked on hundreds of music videos, thousands of commercials, and roughly 40 movies slash TV series, including Red Sparrow, Godzilla, King of the Monsters, The Hunger Games, Mockingjay Part Two, Kong Skull Island, and the list goes on and on. Walter, you're a genius. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I'm clapping. Everyone else could do, do a little pool splash for him down there, a little <laughs> woohoo. Um, and here we go. It's my pleasure to introduce you to the talented Richard Mall. Richard started working in the business in 1976 as a production assistant. He worked oh. in commercials, then slowly gravitated to the grip department. He moved into feature films in the early 80s. He worked as a grip, a dolly grip, a gaffer, um, and a key grip. He's crafted on such prominent projects such as Avatar, Out of Sight, The Italian Job, and Birth of a Nation, just to name a few. He's also been honored with an Academy Award for Technical Achievement for the invention of the Matthews Max Menace arm. Holy cow, Richard. Yay. And we're gonna get into uh, talking to you guys about the Max Menace arm that he invented, so it's killer. Um, so guys, just to start off this amazing event, I don't know how many of you out there are know what a key grip does and what a gaffer does, but just a real brief explanation from the two of you guys would be so helpful for those people that don't. So Richard, we're just gonna start with you. What does a key grip do on set? Well, the, the, the key grip is in charge of the grip department. Um, one thing I like to say is the grips do what either no one wants to do or knows how to do. Um, but if uh, oversimplifying, uh, we deal with changing uh, in lighting, we deal with shadows and changing quality and direction and intensity. Uh, gaffers, Walter will tell you, they put scrim in front of lights, but we'll use flags and nets to change or bounce material to change the direction, quality and intensity of the light. We also deal with rigging um, uh, of lighting. And then in the camera world, we deal with camera movement and placement. So if the camera's moving in a horizontal or vertical plane, it's moved by uh, the grip department, a dolly grip uh, specifically. And then um, if it's mounted on something, it, you know, uh, the grip's job is to do that. So our position, our department touches every department on a film set. Craft service, 
they need something, you know, every department comes to the grip department for help. So we're kind of the service, the service end of the industry where, you know, even the makeup, get into the makeup trailer, they need an Apple box or craft, you know, a wardrobe department needs a C-stand to put some, some clothes on. We, we help in a lot of different ways. That's basically an overview of what, what the grips do. And, and then, thank you for that. But that's being humble because uh, you really are a master craftsman as well, which we're going to get into a little bit once we start breaking down each, each story. So, uh, Walter, please tell us a little bit about what a gaffer does on set. Sure. Um, the gaffer is in charge of the entire lighting department, which includes uh, rigging and then working on first unit uh, lighting sets. Uh, gaffers report directly to the director of photography. So there's usually a very close working relationship with the director of photography, the gaffer, and the key grip. And on a movie, uh, the key grip and the gaffer, if things are running smoothly, they work hand in hand because they're both trying to solve the same problem. Um, so my job is to take whatever the director's vision and the director of photography's interpretation of that vision is and to implement it. Um, that can take on a couple of different, sometimes uh, we just decide to do our own setup and show it to somebody and see if they like it. Usually we're taking, uh, we're taking the cues from the director and the director of photography and coming up with the solutions from a lighting standpoint to help them get what, what they want. It's definitely, it's definitely a job in service to the director of photography and the director. Amazing, which, um, thank you for that, which leads us to our first question that I was dying to know in talking to you guys. What's the best method for the director to communicate their idea or vision of the film to you or a specific shot and more specifically how the camera is going to capture that vision? So how do you integrate with the director on that very thing? Walter, you want to start? No, you go first. Okay. Well, um, I mean, I, I can be um, like specific. Um, uh, there are different directors that have different uh, approaches to how uh, how to best get the uh, you know the feeling or the shot they want. Some um, do a lot of previs. They do a lot of homework and they know the shots they want and. Some of them, they're very specific and they tell you exactly what they want to accomplish. And, or, I mean, I, I can remember working with Frank Darabont. I've done three, four projects with Frank, who's a masterful director who comes very prepared. And I remember on, we did the pilot for The Walking Dead and he came to me in pre-production and said, look, I want to do this shot. I don't know how you're going to figure it out, but here's what I want to accomplish. And he described it as, the camera pulling underneath the, the tank in the kind of the end sequence of the pilot. And, and he kind of threw that out to me and said, here, figure it out. And so, you know, that was someone who had an idea but didn't know how to accomplish it. And so he came to, to me to try and help solve the problem. So when a director does that, and then I've worked with other directors having a clue what they want to do. And then on the moment they say, oh, can we do this? And, and um, they aren't prepared, and then I can't help them. In fact, I actually made a director cry once. Was it? Oh, because nice. <laughs> she did not know what she wanted to accomplish. And then on the day when it was time to do it, and she then realized what, what she wanted, but we didn't have the tool to do what she wanted, I kind of, long story short, I, I, you know, I said I couldn't poop one out. So what do you want to do? Um, but it was because she wasn't, on this Zoom. <laughs> she, she didn't know how to communicate beforehand of what she wanted to accomplish. So directors who come with a vision and they express it to myself or the gaffer or whatever, or the cinematographer, usually that's, they're the ones that are coming up with these ideas and design. They then come to us and we try and help facilitate, you know, what they want to do. So on that note, Richard, and I just want to tell all you guys on the call right now, we have so many amazing, exciting behind the scenes photos and videos that we're going to show you. So I'd like to start with one, um, this exact story that you were talking about, which is from The Walking Dead. So let me share the screen with you guys. And uh, 
So yeah, I'd love to break down in more detail. I'll show the clip and then we could talk about how it all started from A to Z when the director comes to you and says, this is what I want, and then how you designed a plan to give him, he or she, what he wants. Here we go. Yeah. Turn the volume on. You can change the volume on the, on the little clip. Just hit the, hit the speaker and it'll go off. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, so, uh, you know, this is after several weeks of pre-production and, and shooting uh, of, of the pilot. This is how I came up with solving the problem because we only had 20 inches of space to work with. So, uh, um, you know, we built this long um, uh, trust. I mean, this is what, 10, 12 years ago? Um, so- and, and who's the director on this, Richard? That's the camera operator. The director, Frank Darabont, is the right. director. But he came to me with a vision beforehand and, and gave me enough information that I, I could figure out how to accomplish what they wanted to accomplish. Sorry, I don't have the clip. Um, there are some other photographs there of the little remote head. You know, I made a mechanical remote head to pan and tilt the camera. The operator is sitting there. <laughs> if he turned the, when he turns the wheel, the camera, and you can kind of see the shot. Um, but anyway, that's, that's a director who comes with a, with a vision and allows us to, you know, help him create that. So how do you go about coming up with a plan? Uh, experience, um, yeah. figuring out, you know, the, 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 the environment, you know, you have to know the environment you're going to shoot in and, and what you want to accomplish. I knew the height underneath the, the tank. I knew the size of the camera. Um, I knew how far the move was. And so all those things came into play and that's, you know, and also budget. I mean, you know, it was one of those things where, you know, it wasn't a limitless budget film so you always take into consideration time how much time do you have on set to accomplish this and and the budgetary restraints i mean that's what a good department head deals with yeah that uh that was actually goes to our next question that we had lined up was how do you both implement being creative on a limited budget and how can you help the director walter can you speak to this a little bit when you are being asked to do something on a limited budget Sure. Um, I can talk about a project that actually both Richard and I worked on together in uh, 2018. It was a movie called Peppermint. And we had, I, would call, I think it was a 35 or $40 million budget, but they were trying to shoot, uh, you know, $80 million worth of material. Wow. And there was a, there's a scene at the end of the movie that's a big showdown between the, the heroine and the bad guys and the cops and Everybody's showing up all at once in helicopters. And both the director named uh, Pierre Morel and the director of photography, David Lanzenberg, they wanted the helicopter light to feel real. They, they looked into hiring LAPD to fly over the set. We talked about drones. We did all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. uh, but none of, it, none of it, we had specific control. So Richard and I sat down together and bounced around a lot of ideas and came up with uh, taking a moving light on a piece of truss and suspending it from a tower crane um, and then being able to spin it around and then having remote control of the, of the moving light to make it appear as a real helicopter light sweeping. You know, you see a lot of helicopter lights in movies where they, they just kind of do this and you can tell they're in a fixed point. We wanted to have them moving and actually feel like they were moving through a, and I think our set was six square blocks, four square yeah. blocks. And we needed yeah. to see that light sweeping all across there. So we came up with this system. And the, the video you're seeing there is our uh, remote light operator riding on the base of the crane. We tried to get him to do it on the ground, but he couldn't get the, the mojo in the movement. So he wanted to ride on the crane. And that's him. Uh, the light has a camera on it, so he sees where the light is pointing. And uh, we have another clip that shows it wider, but he's basically, you know, on the, I'm on the radio saying, saying, you know, sweep 
uh, sweep the talent, sweep the cars in the background, hit that guy falling on the ground. So he was able to, to accomplish all that while remotely operating this light. What is that rig the camera's on, by the way? Is that something um, like Richard rigged? No, it's, it's, um, it's, a, it's a manufactured piece of equipment. Um, it's, uh, it basically mimics the exact same as a, uh, what's the word, Richard? Follow spot, instead of a follow yeah. spot operator with the light. It's like a follow spot. Uh, it mimics exactly what a follow spot would do. And there's a video, there's a video of the actual helicopter rig in there somewhere. There it is. Yeah, we got it right here, y'alls. Walk us through this. There, so that's the light on the end of the crane. The, cr the crane extended out 180 feet, so we could cover about a 600, uh, 600 square feet, roughly. Is that right, Richard? Yeah, something like that. I think it was, it was a little over 180 feet, 270, but who's we, counting? It was 100 feet, get, 180 feet high. <laughs> we could get light on every inch of the set, which was four blocks square. Um, and even though this looks like a big, complicated setup, it kind of was, but for the for the budget that they had, um, it didn't end up breaking the bank. It was it was expensive, but it it uh, accomplished what they wanted, and that was all just through communication and working through the problem. Well, and knowing in advance, and that's the biggest thing, knowing in advance what you want to accomplish. If this if they showed up in the morning and said hey, it'd be really cool to do this, it never would have happened. Yeah. So you guys, uh, just staying on, on Peppermint, because I know there's uh, several different sections here on Peppermint, do we want to talk about um, a few of the other things? Like we've got this particular car rig. You want to chitty chat about that? Go ahead, Richard. This was a shot where um, the car was going to drive down the street and then someone was going to come out of a manhole cover, stop. The car was going to stop. The actor was going to then go over and get the person out of the car and drive away. So we had to have it look like the actor, the, the, there was a camera inside looking out. And there was also cameras, well, for this shot, camera inside looking out, but it actually saw Jennifer Garner come up out of a manhole cover. The person driving the car stops, then um, uh, she comes over, pulls a gun out, and gets the guy out of the car. She jumps in the car and drives away. So that was what this was all set up for. So you can, I don't know if you can see behind the rear passenger side, you, you can just see the head of the, the driver of the car, exactly. Mm -hmm. So it's called a biscuit rig. It's, it's kind of expensive, but <laughs> it, it was the only way to accomplish what we wanted to accomplish for the lighting and for the camera and the safety of the actors and the, uh, you know, everyone involved. And on this particular rig, uh, this car was driving through a street that had a building on fire in the, in the story. So we, right. we had all the light that represented the, the entire building on fire flashing, but we needed to be able to, to have, let the driver have total freedom to go wherever they wanted and to still be lit inside and to still replicate passing traffic. So these lights uh, here were the headlights uh, that we mimicked and everything on this rig is battery controlled and wireless dimmer. So it's all remotely controlled so that the driver doesn't have to worry about anything. It's, they can just drive. And then we control the lighting, like the passing lights, you know, Headlights didn't, through. didn't it start a whole chase, you know, chase sequence where she was driving crazy through a bunch of traffic? Yes. Yeah, and, and Kelly, you can show the little uh, chalk layout on the floor of the little matchbox cars. Oh, yeah, I did want to get to that. Thanks, Richard. Yeah, this, this is fascinating. So, uh, yeah, that's, that's, you know, the stunt coordinator on the left over there, the operator on the right, the director with his little matchbox cars, just kind of talking about the sequence and, and how to safely go about it with all the stunt performers and the camera operator and the, and the you know, and the, and the car driver, you know, the stunt drivers. And this is um, the stunt coordinator on the left. He did Sicario. He was uh, super competent. 
And sometimes you'll do stunts where it's entirely pre vis It's all 3D exact measurements. But sometimes when you get there on the day, I mean, this was probably an hour before we shot, everybody's want to get everybody on the same page. That's the whole crew. You can't see it, but they're all gathered around. And as simple as chalk and matchbox cars, and we're working out exactly how the sequence is going to go. And that can, that can happen. Uh, I don't think they had the money to do all the previs on this. So there was just a lot of speaking and conversations and communication. And then a final check-in before we did the stunt right here, you know, right there on the set with, with uh, the cars and the chalk. That's awesome. Um, so you guys, on that note, um, is there anything else from Peppermint we want to go over before moving on? Um, you want to do the uh, the house up in uh, Calabasas where it's impossible to get moonlight in there? <laughs> yeah, sure. The Peppermint figure with a, with a light that Richard designed. Oh, Richard's design, yeah. And then also, uh, real quick guys, I wanna interrupt. If anyone has any questions about the exact sequence that we're going over, the exact rig, lighting questions, anything you have, feel free to put them in the chat box. And then I, if I can see them, I'll try to ask them as we go along because I don't want you to forget something if you've got a question. So feel free to put in the chat box. Okay, so I'm gonna go back to screen share and go over a few more photos. Um, okay, yeah, so we've got, where is Richard's design? Yeah. Oh, uh, is this, we wanted to talk about um, Richard's invention. Isn't this, do you guys want to go over this particular rig setup? Well, you can't really see much of it there. That's just the end of it. <laughs> I can talk about this real quick. So this was, this is also on Peppermint. We're shooting in a building in downtown LA that has extreme restrictions about what power of lights can go through their windows and how far they have to be because I guess at some point somebody put a light too close and cracked it. So what we did is we took Richard's uh, Max Menaces mm -hmm. and we put them up on the roof and extended them out. This picture doesn't do it justice. They were probably 16 feet out, which is quite a bit of distance. And we did that all the way around the building so we could look 180 degrees inside the building and it felt like sunlight was coming in from the correct direction um because that was particular to the scene the scene is about uh in peppermint timing is really important time of day and it was overcast outside and raining and we were still able to shoot uh by how they did the angles and it felt like it was sunny to match some of the other scenes we had done okay great we've got another photo here of of the max menace correct no that's a condor <laughs> Oh, I thought this was your, oh, it's still your design though, right? Because I wrote yeah. Richard's design. Let me speak to, Richard, we'll speak to the difficulties of the location and then you can talk about the rig. Yeah, so, I mean, yeah, okay. <laughs> the property in Calabasas, uh, a lot of people shoot there. It's very difficult to get equipment in and out because it's got a huge, long, winding driveway, a lot of weight restrictions. And we wanted to have soft uh, moonlight throughout the whole scene and in some instances they'll use uh helium balloons with lights but the wind was too much of a factor uh cost was a was a factor um so richard came up with this idea of using uh go ahead richard take over well you know within in discussing with walter and and uh david lansenberg the cinematographer we we wanted a, a soft controllable light that we could project in a bunch of different directions. So, you know, uh, to me, it's pretty simple. It's basically, there were 48 eight foot tubes on the face. And then, uh, was that, was it 48? Yeah, think, LED, LED tubes. Yeah, LED tubes uh, on the face and then on either side, but we designed it to have wings. And there's somewhere there's a photograph, I don't know if you have it, Kelly, but the, the sides actually expand. Um, and we could wirelessly or remotely expand the, the light so that we could throw light in the direction, whatever directions we wanted. There's some other photographs there that-, that I, don't think, I don't think it's on her desktop. Yeah. Uh, but, but this particular light, shooting in a tough location at night, high winds, to be able to have a moonlight 
because we shot all over the place, but we could never light the whole place at the same time. Be able to just quickly pan this thing and then, oh, open up the wings. Oh, that throws more light here. It was really a, a clever little trick and got us through. Because we were here for six or seven days, I think. Yeah. On splits where we'd shoot, you know, half the day and then go into night. And that, that saved us. To me, that was a great example of working to give the director as much time as possible as he needs with the actors by not slowing things down with too much mucking around with lighting after every setup. This, this saved a tremendous amount of time, which, get, which the director gets. Awesome, guys. We've got another really great question that was actually given to us by the very talented George Billinger. I'm, I'm pulling most of George Billinger's questions. Um, he may or may not be on the uh, Zoom with us right now um, because he's working, but he was supposed to moderate. I, George, I hope I'm doing a decent job in your place. Um, mm. So, yes, yeah, so this question's excellent. What are the different challenges for the lighting and grip teams on an action film versus a drama? Go, Walter. Uh, I can speak from a, from a lighting standpoint, and I can give two really good examples. So I worked on um, Hong Skull Island, which had a lot of action, a lot of open spaces, a lot of night shoots, a lot of stunts, a lot of special effects and visual effects. And the challenges there were like big, how to simply solve big, big problems in big areas. Um, and I think what Kelly's pulled up here is, uh, there's a scene in Kong Skull Island at the end of the movie, when everything happens around a lake and Samuel Jackson uh, is trying to lure Kong closer so that he can light this lake on fire. Um, and we were shooting in uh, Honolulu and I can't remember, everybody shoots there, I can't, I'm sorry. Kualoa Ranch. We were shooting at Kualoa Ranch we're probably 200 yards from the beach. The ground is soft. And I, we needed to be able to light up this entire thing and have enough light that it was like it was on fire. It was a big set. Um, at one point, we were going to use 25 condors with lights. We were going to ship over BB lights, which are big uh, crane mounted lights. But in this movie, we had a ton of money, but they just for whatever reason, the producers just refused to, to allow us to do those things. So we had to sit down and come up with a different solution. So what we did here was we, we had a road built to come in and circle the whole place. We made a big concrete uh, slab. This is all concrete covered with rock. And then our, my rigging gaffer was driving on the freeway and saw a concrete pump boom um, dumping concrete onto the six floor of a building and he came to me and said what if we could get one of those things in here and and be able to help light up this set so thought about it for a while called the manufacturer they said sure go ahead but we're not going to sign any waiver <laughs> waivers of liability or anything like that so what we did is we, we took this it's a 180 foot concrete pump boom and we built it behind a big tree so it was hidden from the rest of the set and that allowed us to basically, uh, inside is a light box that has 24,000 watts of light um, that's, uh, that's HMI. And we were able to swivel this. Normally, to, to be able to move something, huge distances would take a half hour to 40 minutes. We could move this light anywhere in a 360 degree arc in about two minutes. And it was all done remotely with the guy who operates the concrete pump boom standing right next to me. So those are the kind of challenges on big action movies. Uh, and I got this video here, uh, Walter. So from Kong, I'd like to play this. Oh yeah, this is, this is the short one. It's just, um, this is the deck of an aircraft carrier built in a parking lot. So it's wow. surrounded with green screen. Um, we have lights and cranes all the way around it as if it's out in the ocean. Um, and everything that, that you see with the camera is, um, is visual effects. In the movie, everything that, that looks off of the aircraft carrier is visual effects. So those are the kinds of big movie, like big logistic problems. But some of the problems on, say, a smaller dramatic movie, that's more Kong stuff. Mm -hmm. 
Uh, that's where they built the whole boneyard where all the dead pre previous Kong skull bones are. That was the planning. We all scouted it and said, okay, this bone's going to go here. This is going to be the head. This is going to be the foot. Um, and Tom Hiddleston has a big heroic action scene running through this with a sword, killing bad lizards, basically. <laughs> um, of course he is. <laughs> well, that, go ahead. that definitely helps answer that question in, in a great way. Um, and now, uh, Richard, it's going to be your turn to answer that same question because you worked on a movie called Journey. And um, let me show a video from that and then we'll have you chat about it. You and your voice, please. Yeah, this is a, a, you know, again, on a, a larger budget project, uh, three axis cable cam system that we installed. Um, it, generally, you need to put uh, four points up and they attach, uh, you know, winches and lines to, and this is a difficult terrain also in Cool Ranch, different movie than Walters, but everyone shoots there. But we had to, uh, we actually, you can see a couple of uh, towers trust towers. There's one on the left that's going to be coming up there and, and another one. We couldn't put cranes in because of the terrain, but you know, the rigging department spent two weeks erecting those 80 foot tall towers. Um, and it just allowed us to move the camera in a rather large envelope um, uh, for a couple of different sequences. But that was just using uh, technology that, that existed. Uh, uh, this is also from Journey to Mysterious Island. A director who was not prepared, who came in the morning, decided he wanted to do a shot that uh, basically had the camera pulling straight up uh, uh, off of a, a book on a coffee table. And, you know, when telescopic cranes are great, but you don't get a straight shot you'll get an arc or you you know the person on the the call the pickle to make the the arm go in and out it, it's going to waver back and forth so i came up with this idea of suspending the crane that's a hydroscope a chapman's version of a telescopic crane i put it on a large petty bone and then there's another clip uh kelly of the thing vertical um or a little video of it so this allowed the the camera to uh, move exactly straight up and down and we're not worried about arc and it was a 3 3d camera 3d system also so i mean that's basically the shot straight up and down and this was not something that was given no information was given to us beforehand so i did that on the morning of the shot and uh, you know, it, it may have taken uh, two hours to accomplish, but if we tried to do it with, uh, you know, some someone on the crane arm and someone on the pickle would still be there attempting because I know enough about the director. He was very specific. It needs to come straight up. It has to be straight. It has to be straight. So that was how I solved that. So that goes to your point about, you know, a director being prepared and talking about the difference between when you're working with a prepared director and when you're not, let's, let's have both of you guys talk about that. Well, I mean, the more information you're given from a, from, from a director as a vision, the more we can help uh, with our experience and, and uh, knowing the tools that are available. There's a lot of directors that I've worked with that may not understand all the technical side of, of, of how to accomplish a shot. But if you tell your department heads what you want to accomplish, we can, we can do that research for you and say, hey, does this work? Or we can find out budgetary restraints or we can, I do a lot of work sometimes in trying to solve a problem and, and presenting then a budget to a producer who then goes to the director and goes, we can't afford that. So you have to come up with another concept. Um, or we give a, a couple different options so that, you know, our job is not to limit the director. Our job is to help them, but you can help by asking so also some questions. How long is this shot? Is it, does it have to play out or is there going to be cuts? 
you know, because if you don't have a crane, but you have a condor and you know you're going to cut in and out of the scene, I can do a camera move on a condor as long as you don't use the start and the stop, but it'll look like a crane shot. But those are things that you, you use your experience to ask the right questions, then help them, you know, put their vision on screen. Um, I think um, yeah, go ahead, Walter. I want to address that as well, because this is something that applies to commercials, music videos, TV shows, movies, huge budgets, small budgets. It doesn't matter. I've done $900,000 movies, $1 million movies. It's really about the communication that goes on. A director doesn't have to know how to do everything technically, but they definitely need to know how to communicate that to people and, the, and communicate it to the right people who are there to help them. Um, gaffers and key grips, most of us will walk through glass for a director. We'll, we'll do anything we can to help them and yeah. get what they want. That's the reason I, I love working with talented, smart, creative people. And if you treat them as a, a valuable asset and a tool that you can use to help you achieve what you want, they'll, they'll, you know, they'll research 20 ways to do something and come up with whatever it is you want to do within the budget if they understand what the parameters are and if it happens within enough time to solve the problem. So, okay, but... Alan, Alan, I see Alan asked a, a, a very interesting question. Um, Alan from Pittsburgh. Um, yeah, about, I was just going to go to questions in the chat. Yeah, I was going to do the same thing. Yeah, about working with, uh, um, we are involved in the minutia and the very complicated stuff, you know, so whether it's lighting an insert of a key going into a door or, uh, you know, an explosion that's blowing up half the side of a, a building, we're involved in, in all that, you know, so yes, to your question, we get involved in all the setups, regardless of the scale. Um, and then as for myself, um, I've done 28 movies with one cinematographer. So I end up working a lot with, with specific cinematographers. Um, a lot of times you, you, you build a bond and, and a shorthand and an understanding of how you each like to work. Um, and the same, there's one director, he's probably, you guys probably don't know, Alan Rudolph, uh, I think was a great American director in the, in the uh, early 80s and 90s that I've done nine movies with. I was hired before he hired a cinematographer because I was also the dolly grip, so he knew I was there to help him do whatever he needed done. So, I mean, that's what, there was a, an interview, um, uh, Johnny Carson was interviewing, uh, you know, like Charles, you know, uh, like some famous director, John Houston or something, and, 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 and Johnny Carson said, um, if you could be stuck, you've worked with so many beautiful people, or if you could be stuck on a desert island, who would you be stuck with? And the guy came up with like Vinnie Paluto, and Johnny's like, who the hell's Vinnie Paluto? You've worked with all these beautiful people. He goes, ah, oh, he's my key grip. But Johnny's like, what are you talking about? He goes, <laughs> the island, it'd make me very comfortable. So. That's amazing. <laughs> that's, that's how I try and do my job, with that in mind. I feel the same way about you, Richard. Ah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> um, Walter, I'd love just to get your take on the question too. Can you can see the question in the chat? Looking at it again right now. Boom, boom, boom. Uh, okay. Yeah, it's kind of runs the gamut because I came up through a different route through Richard. Um, I came up through music videos first, non-union stuff work first. So over my career, I've worked with almost a thousand directors, you know, seven or 800 directors. Um, but it does tend to happen that you go on runs with people. Uh, a lot of times schedules don't work out, but you kind of, you do form bonds and you'll go on a two or three year run with the same group of people, the same cinematographer, the same key grip, the same gaffer, the same production designer. And then for whatever reason, not because people don't like each other, but somebody takes a different project and then you don't see each other for another two or three years. So I, I personally don't think it's a good thing to, to only work with one person because you don't learn as much. 
it's good to kind of mix it up, but there are natural, like I work, I've worked with a director of photography named Gil Willems for 20 years. And we did, we used to do freebie music videos out of the back of the station wagon. And then we, you know, over time we did Mockingjay, we've done Red Sparrow, we've done a lot of movies together. And th there's something irreplaceable about having spent time with someone for 20 years making all your mistakes together. Because there are plenty, plenty of, of like embarrassing mistakes along the way. Um, so I like to work with different people, but over time you start to be able to pick and choose people that are nice, people that are pleasant, people that aren't uh, anxiety ridden, people that lo love their jobs and people that are talented. And that's kind of, the more experience you get, the more opportunity you have to be picky about who you want to work with. I don't actually look at projects. I don't, I don't initially, uh, that's obviously what matters, but I look at who's doing this movie? Who are the people I'm gonna be spending six months with? Are they talented? Are they prepared? Are they caring people? Because nobody wants to go in and just be in, a, in an abusive situation for six months, yeah. a big action movie. Um, there are, you can get the best of both worlds where you get to do great movies and it doesn't have to be a good movie, it just has to be really good actors who are, and a really good director who's creative or doing things that, that can move people. That's really, that's, uh, that's how I've gone about it over the last 10 years, just because yeah. I know. Well, that goes to another um, a question, good point about the question from Sarab, which is do grips and gaffers read the entire screenplay before you decide to work with a director and their ideas? Uh, myself, I, I if I, I start reading it, if I like it, I finish reading it. Sometimes I don't get past page six. I'll be honest. I'm a person in my job. I don't care what their lips are doing. I care where they're doing it and how they're doing it. And so, you know, sometimes the story, it doesn't matter to me. I'm as a, I'm a filmmaker. I want to help, but you know, I, I, it's like, like Walter said, it's, I, I, sign on to a project because the people involved, uh, you know, the, the script to me is not that it's, it's, it's unimportant. <laughs> For me, script is really important. I will take, I will take a project with somebody that I have known. And like if Yo Williams called me tomorrow and said he has a movie, I, ha I have uh, trust and faith in his judgment and his artistic sensibilities. Yeah, I would say no problem without ever reading the script. But then I would uh, before I took the job. Then of course before I'd read the whole thing several times. If it's somebody I don't know and haven't worked with, I'll go look at what they've done in the past. I'll read the script. I'll see how much money I'm going to get paid. That's definitely part of it. And um, and and when you read the script, you can see kind of what are some of the challenges you're going to have, and are those enough to keep you interested and motivated? So it's the combination of all of it of everything, the people, the project, stories really, I came from a writing background, so I'm really, stories really important to me. So uh, yes, I read the scripts. <laughs> That's good. Ah. Um, and do you guys ever, do you like to work for, this is a question from Charity in the chat box. Do you like to work with storyboards? Um, I find storyboards can be helpful to get an overall view, but Everyone interprets a, a cartoon differently. And so uh, they, they give you an overall view. They give me an overall view, but, but um, it's very seldom my vision is the same as their vision. So even though it's a storyboard, I mean, no, it's, you know, camera looking through a car window, but, you know, I can get that information without a storyboard. To me, a storyboard means they figured out the shots they want to accomplish. So that's helpful, you know, instead of showing up on the morning and go, I don't know, what do you think? I don't know, what do you think? Well, see, neither one, no one thought, so they're, they're making it up. At least there's some thought, but you know, behind the process, yeah. Yeah. Some preconceived, you know, vision. Uh, what about you, Walter? I think storyboards are a great starting point. Um, I think if, it, if you, there are storyboards that tells you, like you were saying, that the director has gone through the process of trying to imagine their project. So even though to me, they're a jumping off point, maybe they'll be relevant, maybe they won't. It says to me, somebody's really on their game and they're prepared and they're, and they're thinking about this project. Um, 
and I would put those on the same level as shot lists. Both shot lists and storyboards, to me, just show that, that the director is coming with, an, with a vision and with an approach. Whether that ends up, the storyboards end up being the thing that you shoot, maybe you do, maybe you don't, but it tells you that the people you're working with are, are serious. Yeah. This is a great question um, from Charles, uh, or from Alan, Alan Charles. Could you describe a bit your wor working relationship with camera operators? Oh, um, uh, a lot of times very, very close to, because the grip department is involved in actually moving the camera. Um, you know, are we building a dance floor? What are the parameters? Is it a crane? Are, are we rigging it? Or, you know, um, so, uh, you know, I have a very close relationship with some camera operators that I've known for 40 years. Um, um, and my job there is to, one, make them safe above all, make them comfortable, you know, is the dolly shot going to be spinning 360 on a dance floor or what's going to happen? So it's talking with the operator um, and working very closely to accomplish the shot. The cinematographer and the director maybe communicate to a camera operator what they're trying to accomplish, what, the, what you know, what the, the visual feel is. So my job then is to do the mechanics of how to how are we going to move the camera um, so that it can be operated. Are we going to do it with a remote head on the dolly, or is it going to be on a crane or uh, a cable cam system? So I work very closely with operators to make them comfortable and and be able to pull off the shot. Walter. Uh, um, yes, thank um, you. I work. Uh, extremely close with camera operators. Uh, it's always, for me, it's always uh, on a personal basis, it's very friendly. Like one of my best friends, somebody I talk to three or four times a week, whether we're working on the same job or not, is a really well-known camera operator. But the position of gaffer and the position of camera operator are two people going for the same goal, but they butt heads a lot. I'm always yeah. trying to put lights, in a place that is gonna make whatever I want to look nice, look nice. And that's always restricting the freedom of the operator. So operators are always telling me to move my lights. I'm always telling operators to pan right. Um, there's, a, there's a natural balance that happens in a good, and there are some working relationships where if the camera operator doesn't like you, oh. <laughs> he, can, he can set up a huge setup and he can pan three inches to the left. And just, now you have to move the whole thing. Just for or, fun. Yeah, there's just some silly games that go, silly games that go on. So it's always all the key personnel, the gaffer, the key grip, the operator, the director of photography, the production designer. The to me, the cohesiveness of that group on a personal basis is so important because if you get on a movie and somebody doesn't like you or you don't like somebody else, you're gonna work you're, you're both trying to solve the same problems and you're either gonna work together or you're gonna work against each other. And uh, so I go out of my way to accommodate operators, key grips, production designers. I'm there to try to help, help the vision get through. And sometimes that means your department's gonna get screwed. You're not gonna be able to get that light in there. It's not, you're not gonna be able to do this, but you have to make the assessment that, you know, getting the shot this way for the operator is more important. And I think as, as long as everybody keeps in mind the end goal of what you're trying to do, it can be a really re rewarding relationship with all, all people on the crew, including the operator. Yeah. Um, all right, guys, thank you. So I want to jump to another movie because I'm sure people are excited to hear about, let's talk about Godzilla because we've got some really fun uh, behind the scenes to show of Godzilla. So let me go back to screen share. And uh, why don't we just start with uh, these photos? Okay, um, Godzilla was a movie, and this, is a, this happens a lot on big action movies, was a movie that I did not do the original photography on. After they shot the whole movie, they decided for a variety of reasons, some performance-based, some visual effects, some story-based, that they needed to do a big reshoot. And the reshoot was about two months, and it was cost a large amount of money. So I had to go back in because the original gaffer was not available. 
And I had to go back in and recreate a lot of the looks without having some of the same equipment or having the same resources. Uh, and the director of photography on this movie was uh, Larry Scher. Um, oh, wow. So the, the, let's see, the rig on the left is um, we had to replicate people standing in an elevator in space that was going up like 50 stories. Um, and so we had to use these lights on a chase to, to replicate those strips of light as you're going up through an elevator. Um, wow. And we had to move it all over the place constantly. This one was um, in the movie, in, oh, which one is this one? Oh, this one is a spaceship where we needed to replicate uh, the sun coming through windows of the spaceship, just like you would on, say, an airplane. And this was a, another instance where we decided to use a remote head, remote light, um, and put it on the end of a camera crane. Normally a camera would go there and it was, the crane was human operated. And this one, <laughs> this one was tough because the guy who was operating the light had terrible timing. And uh, it was really stress intensive because there's some serious stuff going on in the scene inside. And you see this, this light sweeping by <laughs> and then all of a sudden the guy would jerk it and it looked, you know, ruined the effect. So this was, a, I remember this day in particular was really stressful. But you can see this crane slowly starting to move and this light is uh, panning. And that is Larry Scher, who is, uh, yelling at the gentleman on the, uh, on the uh, <laughs> yelling at the gentleman who's operating the light because we're all in the same headsets and Larry's talking him through like bit by bit okay now pan left just a little bit tip up just ah oh, no 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 it was a uh, um, interesting experience and coming in and replicating what another really competent professional gaffer had had already done and now I have to match it in, in a totally different setting of different scenes and it can't look any different than what he did. That's almost more difficult to me than starting from scratch. But and Walter, are you all. talking about like those, th those individual guys were operating each light individually, so? This, the light that's moving yeah. on, on the end of the crane. Oh, the is, crane is, light, I thought you were talking about these. It's operated, it's operated remotely, and it's just supposed to pass over the windows like a beam of sun in outer space. Got it. But it had to happen perfectly in timing with dialogue that was happening. And so the, uh -huh. the poor guy operating it had to have the context from what was happening on set from what the actors were saying. And he had to have Larry Scher in this ear yelling at him while he's trying to calmly move this light over, the, over this ship in perfect timing. It was, uh, it was actually, it's funny now. It wasn't funny yeah. then. <laughs> yeah. Um, we did a similar thing on Avatar. We put a, a light and a camera up on a techno crane to move over the, you know, the ships because it's the best way to give a, a, a the idea of, of, of motion is, you know, because you can't move the, the ship, we move the lights. Yeah, it's fun. Um, I see. Am I missing anything else from Godzilla? That was the main sequence, right? Yeah, just that, the picture that you just showed was another... Uh, another me putting in a plug for Richard's equipment because oh. <laughs> we're, using, oh, yeah. we're, using, we're using his Max Menace here to get these 20K tungsten lights in. There was no other way to drop them in there and get them there without them being seen on camera. So this just offered me a fast, inexpensive, because this came up last minute and I needed to figure out how to get those lights up there. So I used Richard's Max Menace to get both of them up there and it worked perfect. Um. Yeah, there were some other questions that I think are interesting. Yeah, um, absolutely. We'll go to a couple more questions. Carolyn, Carolyn Scott had a question about communicating with the director versus the DP to create the solution for camera movement. Um, you know, it really depends on how much communication the director and the DP have had together. And if they're in sync on what they want to accomplish, then, you know, they come, you know, usually the cinematographer comes and says, this is what we want to do. This is the shot, A, B, if it's moving or whatever, if we're mounting it on a, a, a plane, a car, a train, whatever. So, um, um, 
and it, it also, for me, it depends on the relationship I have with the director. I did a, a Woody Allen's uh, movie, Cafe Society. I don't think if I was alone in a room with Woody Allen, he knew who I was or what I did. That's just the type of director he is. He doesn't interact with anyone except the actors and the cinematographer. Nothing against Woody. I think he's a talented director, but that's his process. And then I've been in other situations where the director is, is very uh, uh, reliant upon me as a key grip to help him with the camera and moving it and where it's going. I, it's Alan Rudolph, when I was working for him, I would, he would tell me what we would do with the dolly or whatever, then I would tell the cinematographer what the shot was because the way Alan works, it's always moving. So I'm behind the dolly, he's playing with the wheels. This is all, you know, and, and the remote, whatever. And he's like, oh, go, go left, go left. Okay, now go right, you know. And so I would have to then, I would tell the operator and the cinematographer what the shot was, but that was the way Alan worked. So that's, you know, it, to me, it's dependent on the relationship I have with the director or the cinematographer. Hopefully they have a good relationship and then they're on the same page. And then, you know, I can talk to either one about what, what we want to accomplish. What are your yeah. thoughts, Walter? It is a delicate, delicate balancing game. <laughs> uh, when you're working for an accomplished director of photography or an, a, a director of photography who's not accomplished um, about making yourself available to help communicate and receive communication from the director without overstepping your bounds with the director of photography. At the end of the day, I work for the director of photography who he works for the, you know, we all work for the director, but I work directly for the director of photography. So I'm always very careful about I'm most friendly with directors. A lot of directors are friends of mine that I've worked with that I, you know, will hang out socially with while we're working. Usually not when we're not working. Um, but you have to be really careful. I can't say the projects, but I've been in situations where the director felt more comfortable telling me, hey, uh, can we make this such and such? And that's actually something he should be telling the director of photography. So I had to figure out a way politically to make it like I was just the go-between for them. That he was just telling me because it was more convenient because he was right there. It's a delicate game, but the more information you get from a director, just by just by hanging out with them and being around them and listening to what they're saying and asking questions where appropriate, um, good directors will give you the information you need. And they'll also yeah. give it to the director of photography and everybody else. So it's, it's uh, as a gaffer, I've been on situations where I, when I was younger, where I was intimidated by a director. So I would hide from them. I'd never make eye contact. I wouldn't ask them questions or I wouldn't, if they said something while we're on a scout and it didn't make sense to me, I'd never, you know, I'd just put my head down and say, okay, as I've gone through my career, now I'm more comfortable. Um, if you're on a scout, the director says something and you say, hey, so how are we gonna do, I have no problem with that. Um, but that really is the key is communication and collaboration with the director. To the, to, to the level that fits the personalities you're involved with, including the DP, for sure. <laughs> Here's a, a great question from Alex. For both of you guys, what do you wish all directors knew about your positions that would make your jobs easier? <laughs> I, have a, I have my own little saying, and I, I've, I'm, Walter's probably heard this. I wish I could imp implement the 35 pound sandbag rule. Now the 35 pound sandbag rule is my own little dream is that when a director and a cinematographer and a producer leave a scout van, they have to carry a 35 pound sandbag everywhere they go until they find this location. Now, I'm joking, it'll never happen. <laughs> but, but I would wish that they would understand that the army behind them and what is has to be done to help give them their vision. I did a movie many years, I did, I did the two movies that Sam Shepard directed um, many years ago. And, and Sam would get on a horse um, out in the desert and start walking off into the desert on his horse. And I was on a, an ATV kind of following him. And he'd asked me how much dolly track I had. 
And I'd say, well, I got 400 feet. And he'd go, well, lay 200 over here and lay 200 here. But we were two miles from the nearest road. And it's like, but 10 feet from the road looked like the same thing that two miles from the road. So I wish a director would understand, and a lot of them do, the, the work that has to go into getting them their vision. And can my vision be got next to the road? Because all that is, is, is time wasted. If you don't have resources, and even if you have resources, it's still time wasted getting the equipment where it needs to be and moving it around. And, you know, so I wish they would understand all the stuff that, that goes on behind the scenes that's on either side, you know, and, and most of, a lot of them do. Um, but that's one of the things I see young directors not understanding. Well, wait, why, why, why is it taking so long? Well, we're on a third floor of a tenement building and there's one stairway and you have all this stuff you want to accomplish. That's why it's taking so long. Walter? Walter? <laughs> um, I would say it's kind of a similar thing, but in a different way. I'm sure you've all heard the saying, do you want it good, fast, or cheap? Pick two. Um, just understanding, and um, I always hate to see situations where a director backs off of an idea because people grumble about the fact that it's difficult or that it's hard. I don't want to, I don't, I want them to get what they want, but I want them to, to understand what, they don't have to know everything, but they need to know if they're asking for something that is very difficult, then you need enough time or you need more money. Um, or you need to come up with an, uh, you know, uh, an alternate of it. I hate talking directors out of ideas. Uh, oh, the, only, yeah. the only reason I would really do that is for safety. I would never do it for money or effort or manpower or anything like that. But it's very helpful if they understand the broad implications of what they're asking you to do. I mean, I've been on situations where I spent three weeks uh, working out uh, a lighting situation for a, for a small space that had to have people coming in, people coming out. Uh, different lighting cues and on the day the director said nah nah I don't, I don't like any of this and what he described to me then what he wanted was entirely different from what he had described three weeks earlier and he wanted it to be ready to go in like 15 minutes it's just we just we couldn't do it and I hated you know basically failing not being able to give him what he wanted but part of that is uh, if he had understood that it took us three weeks to get him what he specifically had requested. And if he changed his mind, fair enough, all good. We'll do whatever we can. But just understanding the level of time and research it takes to properly into implement some of these ideas. Thank you so much for that. Um, hey, you guys, before we run out of time, I just do want to go back and touch on a couple of great photos that we have from Hunger Games and from Red Sparrow. Um, so. Walter, why don't you talk a little bit about this? And this gives everyone on the call like a chance to understand previs. Okay, so this was for, I can't remember if it's Mockingjay 1 or 2, but basically uh, a bunch of rebels blow up a hydro dam. So we had to build a big uh, mock-up. We, we shot at a real dam and then we shot at a blue screen that was a, replicated as the dam. And so we created, we use a program it's called Vectorworks. So we created the whole situation in 3D so I could tell, did we pick the right cranes? Is the blue screen tall enough? Is the, are the lights coming up over the wall? Are they gonna give us the angle we want, the color temperature we want? So for this one, because they were spending so much money and I think they had 800 extras this night when they shot this, everything had to go off perfectly without a hitch. And one of the ways you do that is you, you build what you're gonna shoot in 3D and then you pre-vis it. I love pre -vis. I think it's great. It's not always necessary on you know medium to smaller setups, but on big setups, it's totally invaluable. Yeah. And then um, we didn't have any more Hunger Games photos though, right? Do we have right here down? Uh, I don't know. <laughs> Okay, and then um, just real quick, wanted to go to this Red Sparrow stuff that I thought was really cool. Um, Red Sparrow shot in Budapest. Budapest doubling is 
uh, Moscow, um, Prague, the United States, um, which it really interesting because because most of Red Sparrow we shot uh, 45 locations in 90 days. Um, every location for the most part was very small. We were using very small amount of lights, uh, but it was just difficult to get things. But this scene in particular, we shot at an abandoned Russian Air Force base that used to be an airport, but it was basically just now, it was just a 3,000 foot concrete strip. It had no lights, it had nothing. We had to recreate the airport for a night sequence. So I think we ended up having 12, 12 or 15 um, 135 foot condors where we put light boxes on them. We brought in the Star Wars fixtures team from England and they built, you know, all the caution lights that run up the center of a you know, runway. They built a 3000 foot run of those lights that we put on a dimmer so we could, we could control it. Um, I don't know if you can see them here, but you see the white dots on the concrete by the soldiers or by the, the yeah. people there? Those are all, those are all LEDs that sequence, and we had to get um, we had to get the equivalent of the European Union's FAA to approve all this because we were within certain flight paths. Plus, there was a helicopter that actually landed in the scene for the movie, so we had to set it up to European airport standards in order to be able to turn this stuff on at night. Um, that was a very large research project. When we actually ended up doing it, was pretty straightforward took a lot of resources, but the planning involved was really complicated uh, just because of all the European Union regulations. But that was totally pre -biz. The director, Francis Lawrence, knew exactly what he wanted. He knew exactly what his shots were gonna be. Uh, and when you work on a Francis Lawrence project, there's a good chance on almost every scene, you're gonna see 360 degrees. So we had to figure out how to hide things, how to make condors that are in the shot not look like condors. Um, that was a good one. That, that was a good challenge. Wow, I bet. Uh, I just want to say that movie was so beautifully shot. So congratulations on that. Um, another quick question in the chat is, um, how much do you have to keep up with new technology and gear to stay ahead of the game and keep up with modern solutions? Um, personally, I'm, uh, if I'm not, paying attention to it, I'm creating it. <laughs> I, I'm a bit of an inventor. I've, I've got a bunch of products that I've developed and I'm always trying to come up with a new, easier, better, because I'm lazy. Uh, that's how I like to think it, you know, um, what is that? Uh, motherhood is in, or I don't know. <laughs> I like to create stuff, but I'm also, one of my jobs is to pay attention to technology and find out for camera, how, to, how the camera moves. Uh, and what are the tools that are available? Um, so I'm I'm always looking at at new technology and if I can implement it um, into what we do. So yeah, I'm very aware of it and 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 enjoy it. Can you on that note, Richard, talk a little bit about the Max Menace arm and and the genesis uh, of that? And well, it actually came about. I was doing a movie called The Majestic, another project Frank Darabont directed. Uh, David Tattersall was a cinematographer and we were shooting in the Grauman's Chinese Theater and they would not allow us to touch the building. Um, um, and it's understandable, it's, it's in a historic, beautiful building. And, and uh, Frank had designed a shot where Jim Carrey's character came in the front door and walked to the concession stand and then walked towards camera and then walked down the aisle um, of the theater and the cinematographer wanted to hang a specific light in a specific spot for this for the shot and and because we couldn't touch anything I'm like ah oh, geez uh, how are we going to do that so I built out of speed rail something very similar in design to the Max Menace arm we had one corner that I behind the camera that I could suspend the light from so I built this thing out of speed rail and then when the film was over I said I want to build something that I don't have to take and build parts it's already made and ready so I did my research and and um, I did study engineering in school which I, anyway I developed the Max Menace arm so that we could safely suspend things 
uh, and make them very fast, adjustable, and, and uh, um, again, safe. Because depending on who you're working with, you never know how they're going to accomplish something. And this is something that, you know, I'm, I'm proud of the fact it's been used worldwide um, um, for many years now. And, you know, it's something that's been embraced because it is safe and fast and it's self-contained. Um, so that's, that's amazing. We're very proud of you too, Richard. And um, Walter, you want to jump in and just about technology and gear? Sure. Yeah. Uh, here's the interesting thing about me as it relates to my job. When I grew up, I flunked two algebra classes. I was terrible at math. Um, when I was in college, I didn't even know how to describe electricity. I didn't know what AC versus DC was. Now my job probably 40% of it is electricity, math, technology. It's in lighting, it is extremely important that you stay up with technology because it's changing so fast. Yeah. In, in the third, you know, motion picture lighting equipment stayed the same for about 50 or 60 years. And then starting in the 80s, uh, HMI came in and then dimming and now LEDs. And uh, you have to keep up with it. Um, I'm not an inventor, so I'm not the guy who's going to be Richard's kind of a first wave guy. I'm not going to be the guy. I might use your prototype if you could come up with something. <laughs> I'm just looking for the best solutions. I yeah. love people who are, uh, I love using new equipment, trying new equipment, testing it, seeing if it works. I've done it several times on projects where I didn't know if it was going to work or not, and uh, but I thought it would. So it's it's super critical. You have to stay up on all of it. In, if you're a director, you don't have to. You don't have to keep up on, you need to know generally what's happening, but you don't have to know the specifics. But a gaffer definitely does, for sure. Um, another question in the chat, is there a specific setup or shot that you've always wanted to do or try, haven't been able to yet, but nonetheless, you put your hat in to try to bring it out on another time? That's a well, great question. Who asked that yeah. question? That's from Parker Ronan. Good job, Parker. Who, who's Parker? Wave your hand. Oh, he's not on the camera, I guess. <laughs> Where? Parker. Say that again. <laughs> oh, there's Parker. See? Hey, Parker. Um, the question is, is there a specific setup or shot that you've always wanted to do or try, but you haven't been able to yet? So you're going to put it in your hat to bring it out another time. Oh, <laughs> personally, uh, I, no, <laughs> the, the short question. I've been doing this, I've done 113 movies. I've been doing this for over 40 years. It's seldom that I get thrown into a situation that I haven't done something similar in the past. I'm not saying it's good or bad, but I, I've, I've used all the tools and so I'm aware. So personally, uh, uh, I, I'm happy to help someone make their vision, but I don't have, oh, I need to do that shot. Um, right. Well, that's I not my a, job. I have a feeling Walter's got something tricky up his sleeve. Um, this is this is a shot that wasn't the, the actual, I got hired to do a Red Bull commercial and we, they wanted to shoot surfers on the North Shore in December at night. So I spent about two weeks working with the director, working with a stunt coordinator, working with um, uh, an oceanographer from Hawaii about how to, how to uh, get 100,000 watt xenon bulbs on the floor of the ocean to light, to backlight and uplight the waves on the North shore. Uh, we were talking about bringing in Navy frigates and generators on top of the frigates and big thick cables that were suspended and reacted to the sea. And we got about two weeks into it and Red Bull said, you guys are crazy and they canceled it. But I would love someday to do that, to basically uplight the North shore with lights from underneath. <laughs> <laughs> that sounds very the abyss of you. Yeah, but see, I'm in. I'll do it. I, you want to do that? Let's do it. I, I, I like the challenge. I can't even see that to Parker's question. I don't even know 
what someone's going to come up with, but whatever they come up with, I'll help do it. Somehow we'll figure it out. If you can afford it, if you can think of it and you can afford it, we can do it. That's the great thing. And, and, and that's actually, you know, in, in working with Jim Cameron on, on Avatar, there was never a limitation. It was never an issue. So if he could come up with an idea, we could make it happen. So, I mean, I never felt like, oh, we can't, we can't do that. Um, I, you know, I don't know. <laughs> yes, necessity is the motherhood of invention. Exactly. Yeah, that, was, that was the phrase. Thanks, guys. <laughs> <laughs> um, so this is a very current question. Um, now that California has been given the green light for production, to restart, how will your positions be impacted by all the new safety measures? Well, I've read all the white paper that, that you know, all, all the varying unions uh, have put together. Some of the studios have put their own together. Um, you know, basically social distancing, temperature taking, wearing masks, uh, disinfecting your equipment, uh, all the things that we do as humans now with the, with the COVID the way it is, uh, you know, and then as a department head, I am responsible to make sure that my team follows the rules. You know, uh, um, you know, if, if you're feeling sick, don't come to work, let us know, you know, those kind of things. So um, I'm hoping producers don't, and when I say this, they don't um, uh, take it out on us by saying, okay, well, now you, you don't get four grips, you get one grip because we can't afford the PPE or we're doing socially distancing. So if there's less people, there's less problems of people getting close to each other. Unless I think on a creative level, the, if, if we're worried about the, the, the coronavirus, people have to adjust how they want to make movies and what they want to make movies of. And, you know, number of people, I, I it's going to be interesting. Yeah, absolutely. Anything to add to that, Walter? Yeah. Um, it depends on the approach you take. Like I have two teenagers, my wife's super conscious about social distancing. We all wear masks. We all wear gloves when we go out, all the kind of stuff that everybody hates to do and in the back of your mind when you see someone else doing it you're like idiot um but i think what's going to happen is the first two months of shooting wherever ha i'm supposed to start a movie in georgia in mid-july which i'm a little nervous about because of the attitude about coronavirus down there but i think what's going to happen is in the first two months it's going to be an absolute mess wherever they're shooting los angeles georgia canada it's going to be a total mess they're, they're, I've read all the white paper stuff. Some of it, any crew member can read and go, that is not going to work. And then you see other stuff and you're like, yeah, that's a pretty good idea. I think what Richard said, it's basically going to come down to wear gloves, wear a mask, proper hygiene. Uh, if you're sick, don't come to work. Um, but I think the first two months of shooting are going to be really difficult as everybody struggles. Since there is no model for how this has happened before, we're going to be the ones who are setting the model. And studio is going to be, uh, I can just see it, like the first two weeks are just going to be clamped down hard about how certain procedures are going to have to go. And then they're going to see how much time that takes and how much it's going to cost. And then they're going to go, well, maybe we don't have to do that one. Maybe we can, we'll try it a different way. Something is going to emerge that's going to be workable. It's going to take into account everybody's safety. It's, allow every, it's going to allow everybody to work. I just think everybody needs to be really patient during that time because yeah. there will be a lot of stupidity. A lot of There's always going to be the person on the crew who's going to flip out and overreact because somebody sneezed over in the corner. You know, every, I think everybody just has to keep cool heads. And I'm, I am actually looking forward to see all the silliness and craziness that goes <laughs> on because I love a good train wreck like anybody else. Um, <laughs> but, something will emerge that is workable that, that will have to become some kind of a national standard. So I'm not looking forward to going through it, but I know that ultimately everything's going to be fine and they're going to figure out these procedures. Film crews are going to stay safe. Uh, doesn't mean nobody's going to get coronavirus, but I think we'll take all the best precautions that, that allow a film to actually be made and people not to die. So, yeah. Yeah. We will see, it's gonna be interesting. All right, guys, we're running out of time, but we've got time for one. Is there anyone else that wants to ask a question 
before we thank these gentlemen for their time, yeah. let them go about their evenings. Uh, feel free to put it in the chat or raise your hand. Time for one. Well, and also, you, you know, if, if anyone has a question or how to accomplish something or you can reach out to Kelly and, and, uh, um, and she can contact me. I'm happy to, to give my two cents about anything, um, uh, how to do a shot, how a, a shot was done. I mean, if you look me up on IMDb, I've, I've done a, I've been around for a while and, and I'm help. I'll always help. It's not about money to me. It's about if it's interesting and the people. So I'm happy to help anyone do anything. Uh, you know, so reach out to Kelly if, if you, something comes to you next week and you go, oh, I really would like to know how a key grip would approach something, reach out to her and then she can, she can track me down. Yeah, as you can tell, these guys are amazing people and super talented and master craftsmen at their game. And you can reach out to me um, and I'll get the message to them at info at scriptoscreens.com. I uh, just want to say thank you guys for joining us. Make sure you like our socials. Uh, go on and uh, go to scriptoscreens.com, go to the bottom and subscribe to our newsletter because we have amazing events like Richard and Walter. We're having them all the time. We're so blessed that um, because of, um, of COVID that these gentlemen have been yeah. out of work for the most part. And so we were able to schedule this stuff, whereas normally they would be working nonstop. They're beasts. And so the fact that you guys have a little bit of time is a blessing for people to hear from veterans like you. So um, it's been an amazing event for me. So educational. I hope you guys enjoyed it. And also don't so, forget, oh, just one last thing, Richard, and then I'll let you guys close out. But don't forget to submit to our contest. Uh, the regular deadline's coming up June 15th. And because you've been to this event, you're going to see Stephanie is putting in the chat that we um, are offering a special discount code to everyone that's come to the event, event 10% uh, off, event 10 off is the code. So she's gonna put it in the chat. So again, thank you. But yeah, if you guys wanna say any closing words, I just wanted to say thank you so much. Well, I just have a question for the, the, the audience that's here. Yeah. Um, what is their background? What do they do? Are, they, are you all screenwriters, potential directors, have been directors, worked in what capacity already in the industry? I just, for my own self, you know, I'd love to know your involvement in the industry and so. I'm, I'm sort of unmuting everyone so that everyone can talk. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a camera operator for 12 years and I just started moving from the reality lifestyle television into more scripted things and I need to learn how to work with groups and <laughs> something I haven't had the luxury of. Wow, ah, cool. Ch Charles, what do you do? Uh, I'm a would-be director and a writer. I've written a couple scripts, and I've done a lot of local video stuff, so I do, I have done a lot of camera work, and I, you know, was very curious about uh, how your guys' uh, expertise interacts with the camera operator and so on. Yeah. Good good really question, Charles. You asked a couple of really good Thank questions. Yeah. Thank you. Ann R.? That's me. Hi. Um, I, I was just writing in the chat. Yes, mm -hmm. I'm a director, um, but I'm looking to do a little bit more on the action side um, and maybe a bit more on the VFX side. So wanting to just keep, you know, educating myself and learning more, especially yeah. on the camera side. My background's in acting, so. Very cool. Parker? Par do Parker. Hey. Yeah. <laughs> Um, I'm a director and writer, but I also, uh, I pay rent as a camera assistant, so. Oh, cool. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right. Great. Sarah? Uh, Sarah? Sarah? Oh, yeah. Um, I'm a screenwriter. I have produced with some, a group of Americans, a film called Altered Minds. Uh, it's already like four years ago. And right now I'm working on my own film which is a historical um, period film on the partition of India based on a station master's story who was working for the British railways in Lahore. I have made a short film. We were hoping to go to festivals with that, but that's not happening now. Uh, everything was canceled, but um, 
So I, I have to look for funding or a studio or somebody to get interested to fund the making of this film. So, well, good uh, luck with it. Thank you. And I'm, I'm working on a second project also. Okay. Oh, yeah. Which good. Will more with Continued children. success, Danielle. Hope to Thank see you, you on the set. Hi. Um, I'm an actor. <laughs> I'm an actor. My boyfriend's actually a photographer, so uh -huh. um, I want to start getting into writing. Um, and I just feel like to be the best actor I can be, I need to understand everyone's job. Yeah, yeah. good for you. No, that's so true. Um, you know, the the and, and I'm just chatting here, but but no, an actor knowing lighting is so important. It helps, and also Ooh. camera movement. And uh, um, for, as an old dolly grip, you know, what, how to stand up, how to sit down, how to move so, so that it's, a, you know, there's a cohesiveness with the operator and the dolly grip and the actor. It's, when it works well and you know what you're doing, it's, it, it works great. It's yeah, just even like learning the, the terms, like, yeah, that was interesting. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah. good luck. Good luck, Thanks for sure. Hard. Make sure the key light's on your face. Yeah. <laughs> and, and, well, and, and, and like knowing that you're not blocking your, you know, blocking the other actor's light, that kind of thing. Those are things that, you know, you would never know if someone didn't say, hey, uh, you're blocking his light. <laughs> right. <laughs> Car Carolyn, what do you do? Uh, I am a director of photography. Uh huh. Very cool. I'm a, yeah, sorry. I have things like very far away. I'm a non union director of photography, uh, mainly in narrative space, uh, occasionally commercials and music videos, but uh -huh. I prefer to stick to narrative. Um, ultimately, I want to be able to do, right now I'm in the super low budget world, but I want to be able to do the big budget action kind of fantasy adventure projects because that's what got me into wanting to do this in the first place. Right. So it's cool just to hear from people that are working on those and how you come up with solutions to light and shoot those because it's a whole other ball game than lighting, you know, tiny little bars or hotels or whatever. Ah, it's all, it all, it's all yeah. part of the process. Bars, bars are not easy to light. Yeah. No, they're not. My uh, Two days before we got shut down, I was shooting a short in a bar with Parker as my AC actually. And hey. it was doing 360 in a bar. It was a little hard to light, that's for sure. I, I did a, uh, uh, I spent about a year exploring being a director of photography back in the early 2000s. And I got hired to shoot a big Budweiser job that I never should have gotten. Shot in a bar and I completely mucked it up. I did a, I, it was terrible. I totally screwed it up. <laughs> it looked awful. The client was angry. I oh, never, no. did, I never did another Budweiser job as a director. Of <laughs> <laughs> plenty of, plenty oh. as a gaffer, but none as a director of photography. Fair but enough. Bars are, bars are hard to light. <laughs> well, Bar, good luck, bars good are hard to light. Your, yeah, good, good luck in your search and your, your endeavors. And then I'm available, by the way. Oh. <laughs> um, <laughs> Joel, what do you do? Actually, I'm a fine art still photographer who does uh, occasionally does BTS and, uh -huh. and basically does a lot of work in what I call available dark. I, do, I, I, I I've been trained to use lighting, but I rarely if ever do, except occasionally for accent. Wow. Very cool. Yeah. Karen? Hang on, hang on. You have to. Okay. I'm unmuted. Now so, you're on. I'm on. I'm. I'm. I've been a career actress. I, I'm writing now quite a lot, and I'm doing quite well with it. But here's the thing that's most interesting about me relative to this is that I worked in arc light on the King Kong set uh, with Jeff Bridges. I was only three years old at the time, but. Oh my gosh. <laughs> that's awesome, especially in. I don't know which is cooler, Jeff Bridges or Arc Lights, but they're both cool. Well, Arc Lights are way, way, way more cool. I know Jeff. Arc Lights are way more cool. <laughs> it was, it was, a, it was a, an incredible experience, especially because they're basically not used anymore. I mean, hardly oh. ever. Oh, no. 
So it was a real skill, and I was I was oblivious to the fact that I was learning a skill, but I'm delighted to have that in my in my history. That's very. I I was able. I burned three jobs with arcs when I was an electrician. Oops. And yeah, a, a lot, plus it's a lost art. The trimming of the arts is a lost art. I'm not sure that yeah. I could do it anymore, but what, I, what, what, what was so amazing to me, other than you know, dealing with the carbons, et cetera, which was lots of fun, was climbing all the way, all the way up there, because it was, I mean, I'm a bit, I'm a bit, I have a bit of vertigo, and it, it, it took some, it was a bit challenging, way, way, way up there. Wow. Yeah. Very cool. Thank you. Who's next, Stephanie? Hello, I actually work with Kelly. Um, I'm her intern, but I wouldn't consider myself an intern anymore. You're definitely um, not an intern anymore. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm a student right now, so um, I'm an aspiring <laughs> director, writer, producer. So I'm just learning from Kelly and from all these, um, you know, Zoom events that we've been doing. And, you know, I just want to say thank you for doing the Zoom event. It was very educational for me. And it's great that you're doing it for scripted screens too. So well, we're all students, students of life. So good luck with all that. Well, who's next, Sarah? Sarah? No, we had Sarah. Oh, we already had Sarah. Oh, yes, she's the one but, with uh, the little shirt. Real quick, Richard from Olga on the chat. She says she's not organized for sound and video right now, but I want to say this meeting is very important for me because it gives me a bigger vision. Thank you so much. Oh, cool. Very cool. Thanks, Olga. Isabella Ponce. Oh, here she is. Hi, Isabella. Hi. Um, I'm a high school student involved with the film program at my school. So this event was actually really helpful to me to learn more about the film industry. Well, that's great. Cool. What, is it, uh, I, I've actually gone to my high, back to my high school and, and, and done a few little talks. Um, uh, so it's, it's kind of fun. So good luck. Where do you go Thank to high you. school, Isabella? Where do you Thank go to high you. school? Where do, where I where? go to John F. D. Oh. In what city? In Granada Hills. Okay. Uh. Cal, Cal State Northridge alone, the below the line feeder school. <laughs> Long Beach Cal State. State in the house. Are you just calling out the people that are in the non videos too? Yeah, Jody. Uh, Jody Jars. Jody. Oh, hold on, let me unmute yeah, you. Yeah, I have to be unmuted. Uh, she's still muted. Well, I asked her to unmute, she has to click it. Oh, there you go. Hi, Jody. I was not expecting to get on. <laughs> oh, that's okay, you can. No, please. Anyway, uh, yeah, I'm I'm like many, uh, mainly an actress, and I did direct a, a short a few years back, and it's won some awards, which I was shocked. Uh, and I fell in love with directing and screenwriting. So the more I know and the more I connect with people, uh, the more I'm empowered, and I can't stop writing and doing and dreaming. <laughs> so... Yeah, so I found today really fascinating. I'm I'm really thrilled that I chose to get on this one. Well, yeah, uh, good luck and, and continued success. Thank you. Yeah, I'm I'm in the middle. Like, uh, oh dear, who was it? Was it Carolyn? Yeah, that um, adventure fantasy kind of film that I'm co-writing, doing rewrites right now, again and again and again and again. Yeah. But it's it's fascinating. I just love it. Cool. Never too old. <laughs> no, no. Age is only in your mind. Yep. Who's da Danielle Warren? Have we? Oh, we saw Danielle. See, it's the faces I re recognize, it's not the names. And Olga says she doesn't have it. I think Faith. it's Faith. Faith. Is Faith with us? And I hope you guys don't mind. I just like to know. <laughs> Yeah, um, sorry, I'm doing two things. Uh, thanks, guys, for talking. This is wonderful. Um, I'm a writer producer. I have a Christmas movie that came out a couple of years ago, and a horror movie is coming out in October. And you guys got my imagination running on how I can make things happen. I love 
uh, coming up with ways to make things work. So this is really, really cool. Well, good. So well, glad continue you joined success. Us. And Olga finally got on, on camera. Hi, Olga. Yeah. Olga. And is that your, Hi. Is that your Hi. partner? Hi, glad to see you. Glenn. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. It's my husband, Rob, and uh, he's wonderful, wise super, and also the general editor all my screenplay. <laughs> ah. yeah, thank you very much. Thank okay. you. It's a uh, big vision. Thank you. Well, mm -hmm. I'm glad I got the chance to meet everyone, and, and uh, I like the, the varying, everyone's different, you know, the all the different things people do in life and in the business and I wish you all wonderful success. I'm not too old, but I do contemplate retiring. No. But we're only working for friends. <laughs> then it's not retiring really. No. Um, so, thank you. you know, thank you all for showing up. Hey, we, I've never done this before, but let's all pose for like a, a snapshot. <laughs> Everyone's faces are like whatever, but let's all like ready. One, two, three. That's great. Sarah, who's that? I'm so sorry. Oh, sorry. We we have one last quick question from Danielle, and then we'll wrap up. Do you guys ever? Um, because I just found out about this. I'm a little sad I didn't get to hear all of it. But do you guys ever post on your social media when you're going to do talks or other like live chats for people to learn from? Personally, yeah. on my social media, I do little little tips, little tricks, little things I've done on set. So any of my social media, I don't do very many talks. It's more about just demonstrating or showing some piece of new equipment or how to do something or that, that's how I deal with social media personally. Hey, hey, Richard, can you write your Instagram down in the chat so everyone oh. can have it? <laughs> And and Walter, what socials are you on? Um, I quit Where? Facebook. I quit Facebook in 2013. <laughs> Stopped doing Instagram shortly after Red Sparrow because I got too wrapped up in it. So now I'm just on Twitter, and only for uh, the Premier League, and for politics. So I have not done much posting. I uh, I get too caught up in it. So I uh, <laughs> I'm always looking to like. Oh, so and so posted a really cool picture of his rig. I guess I better post a cool picture of my rig. So I don't do it that much anymore. So sorry. If you want to talk politics, I'm at Walter Bethel uh, at Twitter. <laughs> okay, at Walter yeah. Bethel at Twitter. But what I was going to say, guys, is I know a bunch of people came in and out and came in late, and some people missed the meeting. So what we do is edit these Zooms in segments, and then we'll put them on, post them on our socials. We've also got a YouTube channel. So make sure to like our YouTube channel, Madison Films. And so you'll get to see a bunch of these segments on there if you missed it, or if you want to go back and watch something or listen to something. But like I was saying, Danielle, if you um, join our newsletter, you'll always get reminders of the events that we have going on. And we have so many exciting people coming up. And so again, um, I'll let you guys all get to your evening. And thank you so much for joining us. And Richard, that was really sweet and kind of you to want to get to know everyone that was you know, joined the meeting and uh, yeah. you guys came to talk about yourselves and share a little bit about yourself and can't thank you, uh, Richard and Walter enough. It was just a joy. So thank you guys and we'll see you on the next event. All right, appreciate Bye everyone. Guys. Thank you. Be safe and be positive of all things. Be positive. We We're gonna get through this. We'll move on. Thank you all. Thanks. thanks for doing this, Kelly. Really appreciate it. Yes, yes. Kelly, I appreciate no, the thank hard work. You guys, it was so Good job. Cool. Yeah, good okay. stuff. Okay, bye, guys. All right. Bye. Cheers.